So what's the difference between a sub $30 HT and one that costs over 10 times as much? Let's take a look. One of the things you've probably noticed when looking at the HT market, whether GMRS or HAM, is that there's a huge price difference for radios which, at first glance, seem to do pretty much the same thing. What is it that makes one radio sell for $25 and another that sells for $150 to $200 in the GMRS space, and what in the world justifies Ham HT selling for $400 to over $700? If you've ever asked yourself those questions, stick around and we'll take a look. Hi, and welcome to the Gadget Talk channel, where we do reviews and how-tos on a variety of electronic gadgets that catch my eye. Be sure to like and subscribe with the notification bell on to keep up with the latest videos. I really appreciate it. In this video, we're going to pull back the covers on what makes perfectly fine budget class HTs, whether GMRS or HAM, cost about $30, while top of the line HTs go for up to $200 in the GMRS market and over $700 in the amateur radio world. To get started, let's take a quick high-level look at how a modern HT works, you know, beyond turning it on and pressing the push to talk button. Nearly all HTs nowadays do most of their signal processing on an integrated circuit of some make or model. These are sometimes called digital signal processors or more generically, systems on a chip. Instead of having large components soldered to the circuit board to make the magic happen, Radios on a chip have many of those functions done using software on the chip. Here's a notional or high-level map of how these radios work. Some designs might change the order in which these steps occur or separate or combine them, but these things need to happen. In addition to these steps, each radio will also have user interface components that help control things like turning on the device, keypad inputs, and microphone and speaker connections. In terms of the radio signal, however, here are the main steps at a 30,000-foot level. First, a signal is collected by the antenna. In our small HTs, this is likely to be an analog FM signal. The next couple of steps can occur in different orders, but the signal usually goes through a low-noise amplifier, a bandpass filter, and an analog to digital converter to turn the signal into a digital format that the processor can deal with. After processing, the signal leaves the processor, is converted back into an analog signal, and amplified and sent to the radio speaker or headset. On the transmitter side of things, your voice input via the microphone goes through a similar process. It may include some filtering, an analog to digital conversion, processing in the processor, output to a digital analog converter, power amplifier, and then onto the antenna. A duplexer plays traffic cop, making sure incoming and outgoing signals go to the right place. Transceivers of this type usually can receive or transmit, but not both at the same time. These are known as half-duplex devices. More complicated radios can do both at the same time, though not on the same frequency. These are known as full-duplex devices. Inexpensive half-duplex HTs simulate this by including what's called a dual watch function. This allows you to listen to two frequencies at the same time. However, when transmitting, both receive frequencies are muted. More expensive radios often have what are called superheterodyne receivers. Instead of sending all the signal directly to the processor, these receivers add a step. Superhet receivers use a mixer with oscillators to convert the received frequency into an intermediate frequency, or IF, that can be 
more efficiently dealt with by the processor. Please don't leave a 10,000 word comment about some technical aspect you think I got wrong. I don't care. This is not supposed to be support material for your electrical engineering degree. Just an overview. So, with the basics out of the way, let's talk about why some radios cost more or less than others. We'll be discussing components, engineering, features and firmware, and brands. Let's get started. You've probably had someone tell you, or you yourself have used the phrase, you get what you pay for. That, of course, means that higher quality products often cost more. That also applies to the components that go into your new HT. Just like most things, there are different quality levels for your radio's components. More expensive radios generally have higher quality parts inside them. They may also have better manufacturing processes and quality control procedures. Those things also cost money. The engineering behind the production also affects price. Lately, I've been frustrated with budget HTs that don't meet the FCC's spurious emissions requirements. In my opinion, that's an engineering issue. A well-engineered radio should have the hardware and filtering and firmware handling that limit those emissions. My experience has been that HTs that cost more usually have better signal quality, thus better engineering. An engineer's time costs money, so I'm absolutely okay paying more for a well-engineered radio. Next on the list is features and firmware. More expensive HTs often have broader feature sets. This means that there may be hardware improvements such as the superheterodyne receiver, GPS, or features that are implemented on the chip and in the firmware. One of the things that has been very impressive in the budget HT market has been the explosion in HT features. Whether with GMRS HTs or HAM HTs, color screens, huge numbers of memories, GPS receivers, and a boatload of other features have made budget level HTs much more feature packed than just a couple of years ago. That being said, there are some features found in more expensive HTs that remain outside the typical budget HT's capability, especially in the ham world. The last thing we'll address before looking at some specific HTs to help tell this story is brand. As with many other products, a brand's reputation is often worth a significant premium when it comes to price. That reputation is often the result of effective combination in the other items we've already discussed. Brands with solid reputation use good components, their radios are well engineered, and have impressive feature lists. Together with those things, along with a history of producing excellent products, results in the brand's positive reputation, and of course, vice versa. In the ham HT marketplace, brands like ICOM, Yesu, and now Kenwood again, command prices from $400 to over $700 for their HTs. Though not anywhere near that price point, GMRS radios made by Oshan and BTEC also enjoy good reputations and, as a result, command a price premium. Hey, just a quick break to let you know that you can support the Gadget Talk channel by using Buy Me a Coffee. It's a crowdsourcing platform where viewers can make one-time donations or become members of the Gadget Talk community. Your support helps provide resources to purchase some of the items reviewed on the channel. I'll put a link in the description below this video. Now, back to our topic. Now, let's take a look at some of the features you'll find on more expensive HTs that aren't normally found on budget models. Here are some features found on more expensive GMRS HTs. First, a compander to compress or expand the audio to better fit the radio's dynamic range. Next, memory banks to help categorize the huge number of available memory channels. There are also NOAA weather alerts in addition to 
the weather channels. More expensive GMRS HTs may also have more than two power levels. They have color displays with custom settings, USB charging, and in some cases, USB programming, as well as high intrusion protection scores for water protection. Rounding out the list are GPS receivers, GMRS data sharing, Bluetooth programming, multiband support, including CB and airband, and last, case color choices. Radios in this category include the BTEC GMRS Pro at about $140, the Oshan KG935G Plus at about $150, and the Oshan KGQ10G at about $220, among others. Higher cost ham analog HTs include most of the above features plus simultaneous multiband frequency scanning, dual receive, full duplex operation, crossband repeater capabilities, a 10 watt power output, tri or quad band transmit capabilities, multiple push to talk buttons, as well as various DTMF related functions, including group call and radio stun and kill commands. Ham HTs in this category range in price from the upper $80 range to about $220 for the ham version of the Oshan KGQ10. Also in this ham category are several high cost HTs from a couple of manufacturers that include digital modes. These include most of the features listed above, plus their respective digital mode features. For those of you new to this, there are three common HT digital modes. These modes convert your transmission to digital signals and allow you to use the internet to connect to various computer-based talk groups that give you access to anyone from around the world who is logged into that group. This is not the time for an expanded description of these modes, other than to say they are DMR, Yesu C4FM, and DSTAR. Naturally, these systems don't work the same way, so you'll need to choose the radio that matches the system you want to use. There is some interoperability, but again, this just isn't the time. Radios in this category will include many of the functions listed in the ham features we just mentioned, plus APRS, or Automated Packet Reporting System, Reception and Transmitting. You'll also find repeater roaming, advanced memory management, voice recording, and of course, the features included with their respective digital mode. Radios in this category include the Anytone 878UV2 for DMR at about $330, the ASU FT5D for C4FM at about $430, the ICOM IC52A for D-Star at about $600, and the new Kenwood THD75A at a whopping $750. Anytone, Yesu, Icom, and Kenwood carry a significant brand premium. Yesu, Icom, and Kenwood are Japanese companies, and their products are very well regarded in terms of quality, features, and engineering. Anytone is a Chinese manufacturer whose reputation is solid, but in my opinion, not quite as high as those of the Japanese companies. In my opinion, the FT5D's feature and overall quality justify the price difference with the Anytone 878. The D-Star feature set embedded in the ICOM model justifies much of the price difference between the Yesu FT5D. The two digital modes are different enough for me to accept a bit of that price difference, even though with my personal economics, I find it hard to spend $600 on a ham HT. The new Kenwood model seems like a lot. Even with the D-Star feature set, I'm not sure what justifies an extra $150 over and above the cost of the top ICOM D-Star HT. Now that's not to say it doesn't. I'm just not informed enough on the new Kenwood to fully understand what that difference might be. Our goal when we started this was to understand the difference between high-priced HTs and their low-priced counterparts. 
we looked at components, engineering, features, and firmware, along with brand reputation. As with all things, what's valuable to me might not be valuable to you. Features you never use aren't worth being, so whether you think a $500 HT is a bargain or a ripoff, well, you're right. What I hope we've done is give you some information that helps you understand what some of the differences are so you can make a choice that's good for you, regardless of where your search takes you. Join me over here for a look at one of the more expensive analog ham HTs we mentioned earlier. Also, be sure to subscribe to the Gadget Talk channel and like the video. Until next time, thanks for watching and 73.